come not from the generosity of the state, but from the hand of God. Yeah, that was John F. Kennedy. Same speech we uh, discuss every week on this program. That's where our rights come from. Americans love a winner and will not tolerate a loser. You know, the more we get closer to our roots and understand our greatness as a nation, we believe that. Americans do love winners. You can act like a man! What's the matter with you? And it all comes down from the patriarch of the Corleone family, as portrayed by one Marlon Brando, Vito Corleone. Hello again, everybody. Third hour of Appointment Radio on a kind of a fun, cool, funky Sunday afternoon, Ben Bueller Garcia joins us in studio today. You've been out there more recently. I thought the morning was very cool, literally and figuratively. Hey, you know, I, I think it has something to do with the Wildcats' victory last night. We're feeling the fall in the air. Now, listen, we I was I did not tell you what I wanted to talk about in the first segment before we get to our great guest, retired Colonel Lee Ellis, who's written a wonderful book. By the way. Uh, our author spent time at the Hanoi Hilton. I'm he, just going to leave it at that for right now. Yeah, he was a guest. I used the quotation yeah. figure as a five-year guest at the Hanoi Hilton. Uh, no, the reason why I bring up the football thing because there's an important lesson. Whenever I don't always, I go to Jody Ayler's show on Wednesdays and I talk sports on our sister station, 104.9 ESPN Radio. And Jody has me on there every uh, Wednesday afternoon. I get to talk sports there. I usually don't like to talk about it here. But... Important lesson, young men and ladies, for the past weeks, the University of Arizona football team were told by those in the media and those in the community, you know, that you really don't have a chance. Vegas told them they didn't have a chance last night. Yeah, well, one of the things I noticed is different, uh, Coach Sitton, this mm-hmm. season over last, and, and some of this touches on some of the, the items that Lee is going to cover and uh, talk about with his book coming up, but, you know, this team didn't give up. There, mm-hmm. you know, the number of teams that have 14 points down in the first quarter would just said, ah, that's it, we're done. And I'm really impressed with the uh, the resiliency of this this group of young men out there. Well, the reason why I bring this up today is that there are certain things that confront young men in particular and young ladies too, and the resolve is broken by outside influences. Yes. You peer group that is not in your best interest. You know, people are telling you you can't win, you can't win. Well, you can accept that from other people or you can tell them negative you and I'm going to do my deal and it's just another important uh, lesson about just playing the game. Yep. It's your life. You live it. You live it, you compete in it Absolutely. and you win. And that's why I put that Americans love a winner because we love people who win and we also love people who give it their all maybe in defeat. Don't leave it on the field. Uh, so that's good. Now, I just do want to tell a happy little story now. It's a little selfish. When you get older, guys, one of the nicest and most liberating feelings, and you won't get it for a while, trust me, it comes a little bit later in life, unfortunately, and that is the feeling that you need to buy things that you need, not things that you want. You know what I mean? You know, when, when you're younger, you kind of, I need that, I want that stereo. I don't need a new stereo, but I want that stereo. I want this, I want that, I want that. Okay. I'm way over that. So, but there is one thing I've, I needed. And I wanted, and it's just the coolest thing. And I, I am, I am waiting. Oh no, it is. It's a guy thing. I can see thing. the look it's on your folks. You can see the look thing. on his face. It's a guy thing. <laughs> Yesterday, I treated myself and bought a new chainsaw, and I, it's just the coolest thing in the world. I am just, it's really, really cool to have a new chainsaw. And right now, I have the oil. The oil is going on each and every link in the chain so that they will work together this afternoon. When I leave the studio, I'm attacking some wayward mesquite branches. Now, th- three years in the Forest Service fighting fires, do you need me to give you a little safety lesson? A lot of people have, you know, lost <laughs> fingers and toes, yeah, mostly toes. I've had them before. This is okay. just, I just All had right, a new model. Second. This is, yeah, this baby's ready to go, though. I'm Whenever you hear a Tucson and say I've got a chainsaw, I, I get worried right <laughs> off the bat because it's not, you know, it's not one of those things that's in Tucson and DNA. <laughs> That's electric or uh, uh, no? This power? one's this one's a little one. I have a fuel power one, but this one is the uh, it's it's a 19 volt little 10 inch because I got some little utility shots to do. But I just whenever we take possession of a chainsaw, I just I just feel good. Yeah, I tell you what, I, I joke about <laughs> that, but with these summer monsoons that come through and blow trees down left and right, a chainsaw is a good a good. I've got two of them. It's a good tool to have. In it's Tucson. a very good tool to. You know, what do you do with the mesquite wood? I burn it. I well, have a fireplace. I use a, when I do the I do barbecue too. See, I have a I have a regular barbecue. I insist on that. I don't do the gas. Now, I, I know some people you like gas, but I know gas. I just do the regular stuff. And um, 
Well, what I do is I take a little bit of briquettes, get them hot, and then I put all this mesquite wood on top. Oh, does that good stuff? Oh, good stuff. If you let you let it season for at least six months. Oh, ideally. absolutely. You can't yeah. just get, yank it out of the tree. I got yeah. the bins where I do that. Okay, just this little <laughs> selfish, happy story today. That important lesson learned. Yeah, there you go. Learned. There's lesson a tip learned. from Daily Mail. That's right. <laughs> Um, we're going to go to the break right now, and I'm going to – oh, excuse me. Before I do that, I forgot to do this. We had Adam Sklar, a former University of Arizona rugby player who's now dedicating a great deal of his time to supporting men and women in uniform, and I promised I would remind people about this next Sunday night. Cool event. Uh, there will be a dinner at the Girls Scouts Hacienda. That's at uh, Sabino Canyon Road. Just uh, It's on the southwest bank or part of uh, that uh, intersection of Sabino Canyon Road and the Wash. And uh, it's a lovely little facility. Listen to this. Seven bucks for adults, three bucks for kids. It's going to be a fun celebration. Just go there and have a first touch with the military. And uh, it's spaghetti dinner. And he's going to ride in a um, one of these rides. And he's just going to support the Marine Semper Fi Fund. Uh, Marine Special Operations Command Foundation, and it's a very great cause. And anybody who does not have a touch with our extraordinary members of the military, this is just another cool thing. They don't do this around the world, folks. It just doesn't happen that way. Trust me on that. So it's it's a great opportunity. Again, that's uh, next Sunday. And if you want to email some or, or go to find out more about the event, it's 4.30. Uh, hang on a second. Let me get that right again. The 430 Challenge, and I want to make sure I've got the correct website here, and I will get to that in just a second. What happened to it there? Now, can I come and just eat spaghetti and not have to actually exercise? Oh, is no one's okay going to exercise at this event. No, okay. this is just I, I to get they got people, bikes yeah. and stuff. Yeah, it's, uh, yeah, it's, uh, it's ride, R-I-D-E, 430, ride numerals, 430.com. Learn all about it. All good. All right, now let's go to the break. When we come back, uh, I will let uh, Ben have the honors uh, of bringing on to our program Colonel Lee Ellis, United States Air Force, retired. Spent time, as uh, you just mentioned a moment ago, uh, Ben, in the uh, as a guest of the uh, North Vietnamese in the Hanoi Hilton. He's got a great new book that has lessons for all. We'll be right back with more of Daily Mail, the third and final hour of our appointment radio visit here on The Truth, Tucson's Right Talk. Picture yeah, it is. I'll let you describe. Well, I'll describe the cover of the book before I let you introduce our guest in just a second. The book is called Leading with Honors. We've mentioned uh, Colonel Lee Ellis spent time in North Vietnam at the Hanoi Hilton. The cover of this book, folks, is pretty uh, stark. What what you see uh, is the the image. There are photographs juxtaposed of one a business suit. It's the bottom of man's trouser in a typical shoe for business purposes, and the right is a barefoot, which obviously has had uh, trauma, uh, a torn uh, trouser, and very evident of someone who has spent time in something as horrible as the Hanoi Hilton. So with that, uh, uh, Colonel Ellis just joins us, but uh, Colonel, good afternoon. Thank you so much for joining our program. Good afternoon, Ben. It's good to be with you. It's Ben and Dave, actually, but I'm going to let, uh, this is Dave, and I'm going to let Ben introduce you uh, right now. So welcome to the program, Daily Mail on the Sunday afternoon. Ben. Hi, Colonel. Welcome back. Good to hear from you again. Thank you. I, I, let me just start off by saying one of the things I'm learning as I do more radio is there is just never enough time for a good yeah. guest. And so you have got just some um, an amazing story. I had the honor of, of hearing you speak. You were the keynote speaker at the recent 12th Air Force 70th anniversary event uh, last month. And after hearing you speak, I rushed right out. I, I bought your book. And I, I, I got to tell you, this is one of the best written books I've ever read uh, to the point. But um, let me just start out, like I said, we're, we don't have enough time to cover all the items, but let me just, as Dave alluded to, you uh, were one of the thousands of young men who heeded the call of duty and went off to war in Vietnam, and uh, you were pretty young when you were shot down. I believe you were flying F-4s at the time. That's and, correct. And you spent five years as a, uh, a guest, I use that term advisedly, at the Hanoi Hilton. And the book and, and your business is... Uh, 
is a product of some of your experiences there and some of the things you learned and some of the the things you saw from your fellow uh, military people in prison there. And, and the book is Leading with Honor. And, and let me just say, folks, go out and buy it. This is a fabulous book. But yeah, take it from there, Lee. I think your your story, you know, tell us briefly how what happened from the day you were shot down to how you ended up at the, the Hanoi Hilton. Okay. Well, uh, I was on my 53rd mission over North Vietnam, so I was more than halfway through a tour. We had to fly 100 missions over the North or one year in the combat zone. So I was uh, pretty experienced. The uh, airplane was hit and it blew up into several pieces. I was able to eject with the uh, automatic system, worked well, and got a good parachute, landed on the ground, and there were uh, militia guys all around me. They captured me very quickly. Uh, it took about two weeks to get to the Hanoi Hilton, during which time uh, we were bombed and strafed by American air power. And fortunately, uh, we found uh, bomb shelters and uh, foxholes, and that just worked out real well and kept us alive. And then the local populace tried to kill me a couple of times, but made it to Hanoi in pretty good shape. And three other guys were on that truck ride with me, bouncing along. We arrived in Hanoi Hilton, and they put us in a six-and-a-half by seven-foot cell, which uh, sounds pretty harsh, but uh, actually it was uh, it was good to have cellmates right away. In the old days, uh, early days, they had lots of room in the Hanoi Hilton, and it might be quite a while before you ever saw a roommate or a cellmate, so we were fortunate in that regard. It was... Uh, you know, kind of like you would expect, pretty harsh environment, not much food. Uh, they were always trying to uh, extract information out of us, especially anti-war propaganda. So there was a daily battle going on for several years. But we had great leadership, and that's what really it turned me uh, around to think about as I saw the, the success of my own career, where I was eight years behind my peers, six years of being gone, and then promoted early a couple of years. So I was able to keep up and have a really good Air Force career. And then I was in leadership development my last six years in the Air Force. And then I've been a leadership consultant for 15 years. And I realized that so much of what I knew about leadership, I actually learned in the Hanoi Hilton and the camps around Hanoi by observing great leaders. And I felt like that needed to be recognized and uh, put in writing and their stories, but also tying those in today's, in today's workplace. Now, Lee, when did you actually sit down and start putting pen to paper on this book? Well, about four years ago, I started out to write a more autobiographical book to capture the stories. And then as I got it about halfway done, I realized that that just wasn't going to work, that my real expertise and what I had to say really was not about me and my story so much it was about the great leadership. And that's what we really needed to hear right now about, um, you know, resilience and leadership and uh, courage to do the right thing, which I call leading with honor. And living with honor, and I just I just switched the book around and started over again completely, and it took me two years. So two, it's been two and a half years now since I started. Yeah, that's, that's a perfect point. Dave and I were just talking about resiliency here, as far as uh, some of the young people in our local athletic teams here. So there's there's 14 key points in your book. We don't have time to cover them all, but uh, hopefully we can spend some time discussing some of the key ones that would be most appropriate to the young people here in Tucson. And before we jump into that, uh, Colonel, uh, and we appreciate so much uh, for you being on the program. Just so you get a, an idea, we have three hours of program we talk about cancer in the first hour last hour is called the american warrior and we specifically asked you to come on daily mail because it's a show about young men and for young men and your book while it definitely has the military metaphor it is really about everyday civilian life and leadership correct yes it is each uh, each chapter has about five pages of the pow stories uh, and then it moves into the lesson and takes those lessons and applies them in today's workplace. So it's really, really written for the leaders that I'm working with every day, which could be anything from a new supervisor to a CEO. And uh, although the, the context will vary depending on the level, the principles uh, stay the same. You know, that's interesting. Uh, you... you um recognize a lot of leaders uh, among your peers, among the fellow prisoners in the camp, but one of the things I found interesting about the book in the early chapters, uh, one of the people that you really commend in effect for for doing his duty is the the Vietnamese soldier who was charged with getting you safely from where you were captured back to the prison and there's a couple of stories in there about how you, you know as you mentioned before some of the civilians wanted to string you up and this guy despite uh, probably fear 
uh, he knew he had a duty to do, and he had the courage to step up and do it. He, he protected you and, you, and uh, your fellow prisoners on the way back to the prison. Yeah, I really, he really was. I was even then. I was odd, but even looking back now, I'm even more so at the uh, the way he was committed to do his duty and the risk that he took to do his duty. Uh, to he really led with honor, and uh, I was uh, blessed by that because I got the Hanoi in good shape. Yeah, relatively good shape. Yeah, relatively good check. A couple couple last questions before we get into the principles in the book, Colonel, if you don't mind. Number one, have you had the opportunity to return to Vietnam in the uh, in the new age? Well, I've had opportunities, but I haven't taken them just because I was too busy. Uh, you know, um, as one of the youngest guys, I'm still uh, working a lot in my company and started two companies in the last 15 years. So all of that has kept me busy and uh, I would go back probably if I had uh, plenty of time on my hands but a lot of my friends have been back they've had a very good experience they've enjoyed it some of them have been back several times uh, a lot of them have uh, been well connected to Vietnamese people in this country some of them have sponsored like their guide over there that they had in the communist country sponsored them to come over here for visits and we have just uh, built some really good bonds with them I've always been fascinated because, as you are, I'm sure, aware that uh, reunion every year in, at uh, Iwo Jima, uh, and we're losing them on both sides of Japanese and American warriors who who have created that bond over there. And it's one of the more probably counterintuitive thoughts that most people who have never served could ever imagine. Yes. Yes, one of the uh, German World War II aces just passed away this week, and uh, through the American Fighter Pilots Group and the Speaking Eagles, which is uh, speakers who are pilots, uh, I got an email yesterday about this guy passing away and how he had been over here many times, and uh, people had enjoyed meeting him. And when I went to Oshkosh this year for the Experimental Aircraft Association's big fly-in, one of the speakers was a uh, retired Brigadier General who had led the Thunderbirds, had shot down a MiG over there in the war. That's the uh, one of the Soviet planes. And he had the guy that he had shot down with him, and they were speaking together uh, up in Oshkosh at the uh, big uh, air show. It's wild stuff, isn't it? Yeah, it is. It is. Uh, I tell you what, in all fairness, uh, Colonel, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, to uh, lay out something real quick. We have about two minutes before we take a hard break for ABC News, and then we'll come back and, we'll, and we will really turn it over to you to discuss each of the, of the segments. But I just want to have this opportunity because uh, Ben just brought the book to me, and I've been looking at the titles, and one of the, one of the concepts strikes me as so important. This program on which you're appearing right now was developed really with three basic principles for young men. Number one is something that's not taught in our culture anymore, which needs to be, and that's the uh, observe the golden rule. Uh-huh. Two is to thine own self be true, which seems to be part of what you're talking about, loading yourself mm-hmm. right there. You know, if you, if you can't be true to yourself, you can't be very good at all. And the third thing, and this will be interesting from you, is to really embrace the notion of competition, which is mm-hmm. not something that we celebrate today. Right. All right, I'll be glad to touch on those, but I'm uh, I'm big on all of those, to be honest with you. <laughs> well, I, I got just from just from perusing the chapter uh, titles, I I gathered that, and uh, as I mentioned, we we do have that one minute left, and uh, uh, just a quick quick follow up to uh, Ben's question: How long has the book been on the market? Uh, the national release is May. The pre-release started last about December the first. Uh, of last year, and then we had the national release uh, May the 8th in Washington, D.C., when it came out and distributed on all the national retailers and online stores and all that. And, you know, I came to aware of this, Dave, with a, a, a friend of both mine and Colonel Ellis, uh, Lieutenant General Robin Rand. He mm-hmm. he came across, Lee, your book, and I, I'm not sure how that happened, but he gives a copy of your book to every single new wing commander or anyone else that he supervises as, as the commander of the 12th Air Force uh, because it's, it's just that good. And I, I got to tell you, the thing I like, you, there's a lot of books out there about you know how to do this, particularly from the business executive coaching standpoint. But to me, your book is perfect for young people in that um, it, it's really spelled out. It's an easy read. Uh, you've got the little boxes called the foot stompers where it's just a mm-hmm. simple sentence or a paragraph, folks, and just take that and apply it right away. You don't make people work to figure out what, what concepts you're trying to tell them. Well, thank you very much. I appreciate that. That's what I was trying to do. You know, I've been in this business of leadership development uh, more than 20 years, counting my Air Force time and my uh, civilian time, and it's uh, something I have a passion for. It's, I guess it's my area of my sweet spot, 
and I just felt like that, uh, you know, I can see the things that are going on. I think I see what people need to know, and I saw the principles that would help them, and that's what I was trying to do is lay those out clearly, but in a way that they could remember. All right, we've got about, uh, still about 45 seconds or so. Last question before we take the break. What, what do you recall in your childhood, whether it be your parents or a mentor or an instructor, that puts you in a position to survive the Hanoi Hilton and draw these remarkable conclusions from that experience? I had always been um, been able to succeed in the things that I went into, so I expected to succeed at that. I think that's important. You have to believe. You have to have faith. You have to believe in yourself. Um, and I'm pretty good in a crisis. I'm much better in a crisis than I am just day-to-day sitting in an office. Uh, I kind of thrive on that, so I guess that was another help. And, uh I just had a real depth of uh, belief about who I am and about my passion and purpose. Wonderful. I believe our listeners are going to enjoy the next half hour. Call people, folks. 1041 The Truth, Tucson's News Talk FM, ABC News at the bottom of the hour is next to Lee Ellis. Daily Mail, hour three of Appointment Radio, heard every Sunday right here on 1041 The Truth, right talk for Tucson. It's the first time I got the new moniker correct. I'm very proud of that. 751-1041 is our telephone number, 520-751-1041. I'm Dave Sitton. Over there is Ben Bueller-Garcia. Our guest is Lee Ellis. The book about which, uh, ladies and gentlemen, you'll hear much more is called Leading with Honor, Leadership Lessons from the Hanoi Hilton. I'll give this information again. It's available. Uh, it's from Freedom Star Media. It's available on Amazon and the usual suspects. So with that, let's begin our chat. Lee, you uh, in the book and, and in your presentation, you you outlined uh, the lines from the closing of of the Lord of the Rings movie as as being particularly applicable to life and how it relates to the to the book. Uh, what 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 are those what are those closing lines? Well, it talks about three things about uh, without uh, without sacrifice, there's no victory. Without loss, there's no freedom. And without suffering, there's no glory. And I added one of those, one to that, and without courage, there's no honor. You can't lead with honor. You can't live with honor without courage. Because there are going to be fears. There are going to be doubts. You know, whether, what are, should I do this or should I do that? What choice should I make here? And especially when it puts you at risk of, People won't like me if I make this choice, or things are going to be difficult. Things are actually going to be harder if I make this choice. Well, the, the right choices usually are hard, but that's why the courage is so important. And so I kind of emphasize throughout the book uh, the whole idea. I call it leaning to the pain of your fears. Mm-hmm. Once you've sorted out what's the right thing to do, you know, you guys talked about the golden rule as being one of your uh, principles of behind your program. Also, to thine own self be true. Well, both of those to actually execute being true to yourself and following the golden rule, it takes a lot of courage because you, uh, you're going to be tempted to cut it, take a shortcut. When the going gets tough, you'll look for an easy way out. And most of the time, for the really hard decisions, you know, like how do we solve our national debt problem? <laughs> uh, how do we get yeah. more people back to work? Those are tough decisions, and it takes a lot of courage because you're going to you're going to upset somebody one way or the other. Uh, whenever you start making those kind of decisions. And I, I tell you, that discussion and, and seeing some of your interviews on your website there, I, that, that discussion about courage and, and our, our elected leadership, that's a whole other conversation, but I, I think you're spot on there. What, one of my favorite lines is, is from a novel as well, the novel Dune. And there's a line in there where uh, the, the hero is told, fear is the mind killer. Yeah. And I, I've tried to remember that for so long because so often I see it in business all the time. You know, we see it in politics. I'm sure you've seen it in the military that it is fear that just freezes people into inaction. And, uh, you know, you address some of the things folks can do about that in your book and, and you just talked about it a little more, but you expound upon that a little bit. I, I know in the book you talked a lot about how some of the, uh, your fellow POWs, they knew that they were going to face punishment for what they did. But they did it anyway because it was the right thing to do. They, they, they passed through their fear into courage. Yeah. I think the thing to look at is, one, sort through, you know, do your due diligence, get wisdom, get good, get, uh, good counsel. What is the right thing to do? And once you decide what the right thing to do is, then you really don't have much choice but to go do it. Now, you want to do it effectively. You want to do it in a wise way. Uh, you don't want to do a knee-jerk. 
But once you decide what the right thing to do is, you just have to, uh, again, lean into the pain and make a plan and go execute that plan. Now, I work with uh, senior leaders sometimes that, believe it or not, they're just such nice guys or ladies that they don't want to fire somebody. Well, there comes a time when you've done your very best to help someone succeed in a role in your organization, and they are just not succeeding, and they're bringing the organization down, the team down, then that's your responsibility is to help that person uh, out of that role and into another role or into another organization. And so I've actually had to coach people how to do that, actually help them by writing a script and said, you know, just get this script down and just say it. And, you know, you're doing the right thing. You're doing the right thing for the person. You're doing the right thing for your organization. So it uh, it comes in all shapes. You know, our fears comes in all shapes and sizes. Different people have different fears. We all have different kinds of courage. Some people have uh, very strong courage in some areas, but uh, not so strong in other areas. And so we have to realize that when we're leading people and when we're, when we're leading ourselves, that sometimes we're going to hit spots where we have fear and we got to figure out how to deal with it. Yeah, you know, it's interesting you say that. I, I, it just came to me that... Uh like shooting a gun or maybe flying a, a, a plane, there's you know muscle memory takes over if you practice it enough, and it's exactly. kind of sad to say, but sometimes doing the right thing requires a lot of practice too. Absolutely, it does. It gets easier as you practice it, and I think that's that's a very key point. Is uh, and that's one of the things I do in coaching. We're trying to change behaviors when coaching because if you don't change, you're not doing anything different, so everything's the same. So I get people uh, to do something different and then recognize that they did it different and what happened and then do something, you know, keep repeating that that behavior until it becomes a habit and feels the fear kind of goes away. It's like, uh, you know, teaching a kid to swim that's never been in the water. You know, you've got to work with them to kind of get overcome that fear. You know, if I was going to try to become a Navy SEAL, which I wouldn't because I'm not that tough, but I would have to overcome some fears of the water, especially the deep water and uh, the types of swimming they do. Colonel, you mentioned something a moment ago that just strikes me about our culture today. And, and, and of course, those of us who can recall anything about President Lincoln understand that he was rejected many times for many of the things he wanted most in life. And it ended up being one of our most beloved and at the time perhaps the best suited to be president during that horrible time of the Civil War. One of the things I find fascinating is that we do, we just despise rejection to, to such an extent we don't understand the strength that we can derive from rejection. I'll, I, you know, I can use a, a military metaphor and as well as a sports metaphor. We had a guy out here who was a pretty good pitcher by the name of Randy Johnson. Right. He's going to be a Hall of Fame baseball pitcher. Right. Correct? Right. But he couldn't spend five minutes in right field. And I'm sure in your military career, there are some guys who work the flight line in the worst of circumstances that could not be the pilot of an aircraft. People have different positions, and we work our way through life through rejection and success so we can find and settle in those places where we're strongest. Exactly, yeah. Um, I love to play basketball, but I'll never be able to dunk one, you know? <laughs> yeah, you and me both, <laughs> I brother. Face, I had to face that and get a good outside jump shot. <laughs> uh, you're exactly right. And there are things that, that I spend time on every day that I'm not very good at, and I'm just not willing yet to pay somebody to do some of those. And some of those I couldn't pay somebody. I do have to do them. You know, some of the articles and blogs that I write, you know, I've got to sit down and write those myself. And I don't mind doing them that much. It's actually making myself sit down and start writing. But we all have areas where um, where we, we're either not so good at it, we just don't have the confidence, we just don't have the practice at it. But we can get a lot better. And I really believe that you can develop courage. Now, there's a certain courage, certain personalities have more courage, outward courage, about fighting the enemy or whatever than others. But but I really believe that uh, you can develop courage uh, just through repetitive practices and experience. You go through something and say, well, that wasn't so bad, and I'll be more courageous next time. You know, Lee, kind of touching on that, I, I, what is your perspective in today's society with television, the Internet, and the movies? It strikes me that as a whole, we, we've almost come to expect people not to be human anymore, to expect people to be flawless. And that contributes to the the thing, uh, the idea that folks are afraid to do anything because they're afraid of making a mistake when that's a perfectly natural and very healthy and effective way of learning, uh, learning and, and, and navigating your way through life. Yes, it is, and thankfully I had some leaders that allowed me to make some mistakes. 
uh, I probably didn't do as well of that with the people that were under me. Well, some of them I did. I probably wasn't as good at that at home as I was at work. But allowing people to make mistakes, that's really the best way they learn. Uh, obviously, you don't want them to make drastic mistakes. Those you want to tell them about and read about uh, and learn that way. But uh, it is important for us to realize that no one is perfect. And I think I've read... I've worked for a lot of leaders, a lot of really good leaders. I've read many biographies of leaders. Uh, I read a lot of those, and I have not found a one perfect yet. In fact, I'm reading um, one right now, uh, my second or third one, on Winston Churchill. Well, the guy was brilliant, and he was a great leader for the times, and he had so many strengths, but he had a lot of flaws, too. And, you know, that's just the reality of all leaders. Well, and it's interesting you should bring him up because I know enough about him to be dangerous, and he had a military disaster in World War One. Yeah, he did, uh, although some would say that it was the problem was the generals and admirals leading it, that he had a pretty good strategy. Others would say, well, it, the strategy was failed because he didn't recognize the limitations of his generals and admirals. But he was the the um, head of the admiralty, which was basically like the military and all the, the seagoing military, which was most of their military at the Battle of Gallipoli in World War One, which is over in the in the Straits of Dardanelles area there in Turkey. And it was a disaster, and they lost uh, a lot of men there, and he fell into disfavor because of that, because he was a person who pushed it and made that decision to do that. It was his perseverance of his own personality, because as we go back and look at where he became great, and he's remembered forever, was his ability to make people believe that through perseverance that we will continue fighting until there is no more fight, that we will be victorious. He was talking, of course, to the British people and his allies. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and, and again, I, I just look at the stark um, quirk of history that placed him in that position at Gallipoli, Gallipoli and set him up for World War II. Oh, yeah. That's right. It was he was he he had actually had war experience. He had so much political experience, so he understood it. And then he was the, one of the few that actually knew what was going on with Hitler and would accept it. And there was so the, England had become so pacifist. Mm -hmm. Europe had after World War One, their losses were so big that the people didn't want anything to do with war. And he kept saying, "Well, Hitler's getting stronger. We better build up our military." And they just didn't want to hear it. But you know. Uh, this whole idea of of com competition and being aware and and growing through competition, which is another one of your points here, I think. Yes, sir. Uh, you know, I um, I've seen and and believing that you can win. Talking about um, Churchill, I uh, I still play basketball, and while I was on vacation, I went to the gym and played some basketball, and uh, I was just playing to get the exercise. But as once we got started. Then I had to decide, was I really going to go for it? And I did. And I'm just always amazed at how many times when I just really commit that we just need to win this game, that we do. And I'm not the world's greatest basketball player, but it's like <laughs> once you make up your mind you're going to win, it's really hard for the other team to beat you. Absolutely. We're going to take a break. We have Colonel Lee Ellis, United States Air Force, retired, real live American hero. The book is Leading with Honor. It's available from... Freedom Star Media. We'll be back with the Colonel. If you want to join, give us a call, 520-751-1041. It's Sunday. It's Employment Radio. We'll be right back. Breaking my heart. It's the end of summer. This is the, I know, May, June, before we lose the summertime here. Mungo Jerry, British group of all people. How about that? Uh, our guest today on Daily Mail, ordinarily you'd think we'd have a military leader like a colonel from the United States Air Force, Lee Ellis, be with us uh, in the uh, American Warrior segment, but it makes perfect sense. His book called Leading with Honor uh, is really for civilian applications. I just have one quick uh, question as we get back to the conversation, uh, Colonel. I'm looking at the aircraft. Was it, uh, in fact, an F-4 that you were downed? Yes, that's correct. That's. Uh, I was out recently, Davis Monthan Air Force Base, and we took all of our our F fours out of the boneyard. I know you're familiar with that area over there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I was with one of the recent commanders, and I tapped one on the back. They were turning them into drones. Broke my heart. 
And his comment was, this is this aircraft is proof that with enough thrust, a brick will fly. <laughs> yeah, that's right. That's right. Yeah, you know, I was at Davis Mountain in 1966 for a couple of months for some training in the F-4. And uh, Colonel Chappie James was the director of operations, the uh, first African-American to make four stars. And, of course, he went over to Ubon and was flew with uh, Robin Olds, Colonel Robin Olds, who came through there at that time to get his check out. And those, they were together over there, and uh, the joke was Black Man and Robin. <laughs> and, uh, that was uh, they were quite a team over there. Lee, you uh, in, your, in your book you talk a lot about winning and and fighting to win. Mm-hmm. And you know, off the air we were just talking about how it seems like in today's younger generation you hear a lot of "I deserve, I deserve," and you know, folks kind of want to take the easy way out. Talk a little bit about the importance of always striving to win, but not going overboard. I guess I'd just start by saying when I was growing up, my mother was a school teacher, and one of her students, who was in industrial arts class also, made her a sign. It was about three and a half feet wide and about ten inches high, and it was carved into wood. And it said, uh, the elevator to success is not running. You'll have to take the stairs. <laughs> Good point. And so uh, that mindset has always been in me, and it's really helped me because I realize that, you know, life just doesn't come walking up to you. I mean, occasionally it does. There, it, luck is important. But generally, uh, preparation and hard work matched with your talents and then the, the over and over repetitive training and experience that you get, you put that together, you're probably going to be successful. If you feel like that your things should happen because you deserve it, because you live in America and deserve it, you're probably going to be pretty disappointed. So I've just found out that there's a great uh, challenge ahead. I look forward to challenges. I believe that in this country, uh, you know, a person can succeed if they want to. Uh, they can get educated, they can get a job, they can find another job if that one doesn't match them so well. And uh, if they believe in themselves and they have, if they believe in themselves and they do the right things and are dependable and reliable, somebody like me is going to see them and I'm going to help them. Uh, you know, there's people out there every day that are looking to help people move up and move forward uh, if they have the right attitude and they're responsible and they're hard worker. So I just think competing, you can call that competing, uh, fighting to win. I, I believe that we should fight to win. Obviously, I don't believe in running over people and win at all costs. That uh, that doesn't, you know, too much ambition can be hard, uh, ruinous, and so we have to watch out for that. But the lesson of the POW camp was that we were always fighting to win. We expected that someday we would defeat this enemy in the POW camps in that we would deny them uh, making uh, c- converts of us into communism and that we would be- remain faithful to our country and that someday we would come home. So we fought that battle every day. And that was a good battle to fight, and we believed we could win it, and we did win it, and we came home, and that's really a lot of the credit of those people who led us with honor. So I just think that if you believe that you can and you keep working at it and you fight, you figure out what do you need to do, figure out a plan, and you go execute your plan, then uh, the odds of winning are very, very high. And if you don't win, you're going to learn so much out of that that the next time you play the game uh, of life, you'll be much more, much better prepared to win. Colonel, one of the things about competition is probably embodied in everything you did at Hanoi Hill because your competition was about survival. And because you were competing with yourself to survive and what, what, people don't get which drives us out of our minds here is that right now with our insistence that we continue to use tobacco we're causing about 30 percent of all cancer cases in the country another 30 percent of cancer cases and heart disease comes from us not having the ability to compete with ourselves to make ourselves fit in other words obesity which is obviously a a uh, a, um, a problem about balancing our nutritional needs with our exercise needs. And if you don't mind commenting on that, that yeah, really competition is a very personal thing. Well, it is, and I'd love to comment on that because I'm actually thinking a lot about that right now. You see, it really comes down to personal discipline, uh, self-management and personal discipline. And that's the first battle we have to win to be successful. So we have to be disciplined. We have to be disciplined to get an education. If you, one thing you'll notice that the more educated a person is, the less likely they are to be a smoker and the less likely they are to be overweight. 
and the less educated they are, the more likely they are to be overweight and to be a smoker. And you can just go hang out in the ER rooms and the hospitals, and you can, you know, check my facts there, check that out. But the, all the, the data shows that. People who have more education are not necessarily smarter. They just have more discipline. So they go to class, and they finish school, then they get a better job, and they just have more personal discipline, which shows up in the eating and the drinking and the smoking. So it does come down to competing with yourself to take care of yourself and to have that personal discipline to do the things you know you ought to do to live a healthy life and a responsible life. Yeah, and Colonel, I'm so glad you. Th- this has been great. This last segment, you you touched on a thing that I I just I always like to pound in uh, the idea of mentorship. You know, f- uh, for a young person today, find someone you respect, find someone you admire. Heck, find someone you're afraid of, <laughs> and ask for yeah. their help. And I think young yeah. people out there would be shocked to find out how many of us are more than willing to provide our our counsel and advice to them to help them avoid the mistakes that we unfortunately learn from. I'll tell you, there's no greater reward for me than seeing my uh, the people that I've mentored or taught or led along the way to see them succeed. And to see them succeed much higher levels than me, I just I, that's the greatest reward is to see these young people. They used to be my cadets. Now one of them's a two-star general in charge of all the Georgia Guard. Another one just made a star, and he's gone to Europe to be director of logistics in USAFE. Uh, they're just all over the place, and they're doing great. And uh, one of my captains uh, became the vice chief of staff of the Air Force, four-star general. And, I mean, they're all sharp to start with. And, but just for me to have one little piece of uh, of their success and be able to have encouraged them at the right point in time is a great reward. And I agree with you. A lot of people are out there looking to find people who have a good attitude and want to learn and grow and want to make something in their life, and they're going to bend over backwards to help them. Now, Colonel, as we, we kind of head into the close here, I know that sometimes in my generation it's it's folks – yeah, you always complain about young people nowadays, and, and you know today that people ah, like to to, like to bag on the millennials. But I, I, from what I've seen of your interviews, uh, you actually have got uh, you're impressed. You've got a lot of hope for this next generation coming up. Yeah, I really do. Um, they're smart and they're dedicated to the things that they know about to be dedicated to. And the military, obviously, they're outstanding. But I see that in other areas too. And they just need good leadership. They need a little bit different kind of leadership. You know, World War II mentality leadership, boot camp mentality leadership is not going to work very well with them. But inspired leadership that understands how to, uh, connect with them and how to inspire them and and to set high standards for them. I think we can set high standards for them, but we do have to manage them a little bit differently uh, just because of their upbringing. Their values about work are a little bit different about when to work. You know, they might want to work from 10 at, 10 at night until 2 in the morning. They might be, uh, that's just what they've always done, and so we may have to work with that. Yeah, it's so funny you mentioned that. I was talking last night with a, a colonel in the Panamanian Air Forces, and we are just talking about the changes he's seen, and he remarked how young people nowadays are still, you know, he sees in his Air Forces there, uh, they still respond to orders, but they're so much more inquisitive. So before where you would just get a salute and that's all you could do, now you get a salute and then afterwards they they want to know why. Yeah. Why, you know, why are we charging up Pork Chop Hill? So sure. uh, very, very interesting. And that's yeah. not bad. That's not bad at all. I agree with that. I think it's uh, I think it's great because it makes them much more capable of operating on their own without us telling them, being there to tell them what to do. You now, know, if we can just get them to figure out how to operate without electricity and uh, what you do when there's no internet and no cell phone, well, I'll feel a lot more comfortable. Work, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> real quick observation in business. I know we're getting to the very, very end, but real quick, Colonel, your observations, because this is counterintuitive to a lot of people, about your, your better commanders, your better mentors want good feedback from those who are in their command. In other words, a military commander, if there's somebody who's got a better idea to do something, they'll take that and the same thing in business. And we really don't embrace that enough. Yes, uh, you're exactly right. I think that the great leaders that I work with have a lot of confidence in their ideas and their opinions, but they recognize they don't know everything, and so they they look to the people around them to fill in and to share uh, important insights and views uh, so that they can make a good decision by having all this other information and other perspectives.